Good morning, church family. Uh, great to be with you this morning. I'm coming to you from my brother-in-law's church here in Edmonton, uh, where he's helping me pre-record this message for our service. Uh, our hope is that we can be together again soon, uh, that we can have people gathered in the room for our services again in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, but I'm thankful for the opportunity and the privilege to speak this morning because of the fact that we're all gathered together online. Uh, you know, it's been a year since we were last all together at Warden and Shepherd. March 15th, 2020, about 100 of us gathered there at the church knowing that a lockdown was imminent the next day. And by March 22nd, the next week, we held our first online service. It's been a long year. I don't know, for you, on the one hand, maybe it has dragged on. It's dragged on, and as it has dragged on, it, the pandemic has actually gotten closer to you. Uh, maybe you actually know someone who's struggled with COVID, or maybe you actually know of someone who's passed away because of it. Or maybe just the lengthy lockdowns, isolation, unemployment, and other challenges have increased your struggle and suffering over the last few months. And so as time has gone on, the pandemic and its effects have gotten closer to you. On the other hand, maybe you know someone who's actually been vaccinated. And maybe you know that in the coming weeks, maybe in the coming months, you know that your time to be vaccinated is coming up. And with that, there's just this little glimmer of hope, a little flutter of light at the end of the tunnel, uh, just the smallest possibility that the pandemic is being pushed away from us. And there's that anticipation of a return to life as we once knew it. At both and was the last message I spoke at Warden. August 16th, the day that Kirsten and I and her parents began driving across the country. It wasn't really a farewell because we knew I was going to continue to serve our church family from a distance. But it still felt like I needed to say something significant. Uh, something important. So I attempted in that message in about 30 minutes uh, to preach the entire Bible. That was an undertaking, maybe, maybe a little too ambitious. So now that I have the opportunity to speak again this morning, I've decided that instead of trying to preach the whole Bible, I'm just going to preach on one verse, just one verse only. Just keep it nice and simple. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says this. One whose imagination is steadfast, you will keep in perfect peace, for in you they trust. I know we're not all together in the same room. Uh, we're joining from a bunch of different places, but from wherever you're joining us, if you're on your own, if you're with your family, you're in your kitchen, your living room, maybe you're still in bed watching this on your phone, let's join our voices together and read this verse aloud. The words are on the screen, so let's read together Isaiah 26, verse 3. It says, One whose imagination is steadfast, you will keep in perfect peace for in you they trust. I don't know about you, but perfect peace sounds real good to me. I want some of that. Like, sign me up for this. Perhaps you've noticed the world is incredibly polarized. There's outrage and fear everywhere we look. And that's not just out in the world, that's in the church as well. And not just out there, but personally, I'm an anxious person. I've struggled with anxiety in the past, and sometimes it still flares up. So this idea of perfect peace, sign me up. Tell me where I need to put my name down on the dotted line. In Hebrew, we know the word for peace is shalom. And we know that it means more than just simple calm or quiet, the opposite of irritation or conflict. Shalom is about completeness, soundness, wholeness. In this verse, it's repeated. Shalom, shalom. Peace, peace. Back in the day, they didn't have autocorrect, and I really don't know how they made it. Like, I don't know how they survived. I often don't know how to spell a word, and so I'll just try a bunch of different ways of typing it out, of spelling it out, hoping that my phone or hoping that autocorrect will figure out, oh, you're, you're trying to spell this word. 
Um, sometimes my phone and my computer just gives up because they don't know what word I'm trying to spell. I, I'm that far off in my spelling. But again, they didn't have autocorrect. They didn't have a word processor that gave them a red squiggly line underneath a word that was spelled wrong or grammarly asking them, did you mean to put this word twice in this sentence? But shalom is repeated here intentionally as a way of heightening this expression. Not just peace, but perfect peace. Not just wholeness, but true wholeness. Not just some good, some well-being, but complete completeness. And this verse says that God will keep one in perfect peace. Will watch, will guard, will keep and protect a person within this place of wholeness. Church, that's a beautiful picture. This shalom is God's desire for us. Shalom is God's desire for the church for the world, and for creation. Now, before we look at how we can enter into this place of perfect peace, and before we try to parse out what it means to have steadfast imagination, we need a little context. See, you can't just preach on one verse and not give a little bit of context of where that verse is coming from. I'm, we jumped into this chapter at verse three. What are the verses saying before it? What are the verses saying after it? You know, that sort of thing. So I promised you I'm still preaching on one verse, just the one verse, but taking some time to look at a little bit of the surrounding context, that's just good hermeneutics. It's good practice. It'll help us understand this verse properly. So we, we just need to, to look at a little context. So Genesis. Genesis. God creates the world and brings order out of chaos. He plants a garden. He creates the first humans, a male and a female. And he gives them the power and responsibility to rule over the world, uh, rule over the earth. They're created in his image and given the instruction to be fruitful, to be multiplied, to fill the earth and subdue it. They're made to make culture to turn this garden into a flourishing city, a flourishing society, a flourishing kingdom, and they're par- to partner with God as his representatives on the earth. We know that instead of working with God, they choose their own way, and it's disastrous. But that doesn't mean that God gives up on his original dream for what the garden was to become. God still desires to have a people of his own uh, who follow after his own design for human life here on the earth. So he calls a people, but they end up being enslaved in Egypt. They're being worked to death. This is not the garden vision. God hears the cries and groans of his people and he is moved to act on their behalf. Whole nother message there. God recruits Moses to partner with him in bringing the Hebrews out of Egypt, to bringing his people out of slavery, and it succeeds. They're free, they're moving towards the promised land, and as they travel, Moses meets with God and receives the Ten Commandments and the law. We tend to view these laws, the Ten Commandments, the laws that we find in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, as their means towards salvation. The people needed to do these things in order to be saved, in order to be in relationship with God. But another way of looking at them is as their charter of rights and freedoms. The Ten uh, Commandments is also called the Decalogue, the Ten Sayings. It begins, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The concern in these sayings, in these laws, is how God's people are to be different. He's reminding them they just came out of Egypt, out of a different kingdom, out of a different empire that had a certain way towards life. But they are called to be different from that. So as they begin to travel and as they begin to think and set up their society, their new way of life, they need to be remembering how that, uh, to remember to be different from the kingdoms around them. They need to remain free. And so these laws are given to them to show them how to be different. 
So how does it go? Well, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, the Israelites have a hard time staying faithful to God's instructions. Even in the desert, they long to go back to Egypt. And once they have their own land, their own nation, their own kingdom, they easily fall back into the ways of the kingdoms around them. They start chasing after the same affluence, the same wealth, uh, the same power that was used against them in Egypt. They repeatedly turn away from God and his ways and they follow the ways and the kingdoms of this world. And so come along the prophets. Prophets aren't just people who tell the future, who predict what's gonna happen. They are truth tellers. They speak on behalf of God and say how things really are. Their future telling is rooted in how the future impinges on the present. So often that means pronouncing coming judgment and calling on the people to repent. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann calls this prophetic imagination. He writes, quote, The task of prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. The prophets were to see how things really were and to criticize and dismantle the dominant consciousness, to pull back the curtain. The world is not as it seems. They reveal how the ways of the world, the dominant consciousness, are ways that only ever lead to death. At the same time as awakening the people to see these things, the prophets were also to energize them towards an alternative consciousness, towards back going to, uh, back to God and his ways. Put another way, the prophets were to call out the people when they began living like the world and to inspire them back to the ways of God, to the way that God intended them to live as a set apart people. So it's here, this is the context, within this prophetic tradition that we read these verses from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, The section we're in starts at chapter 24, uh, where Isaiah gives a very grim look at the destruction that's to come to the world, that's to befall the earth. The point of all this destruction is to awaken the Israelites to see that the ways of the kingdoms of this world will will not lead to peace or true life, but will only ever lead to death. Chapter 25 then points to Zion, the Lord's holy mountain, the kingdom of God as the only way to find God's favor and true life and lasting peace. So we've made our way back to Isaiah 26. Here are the first four verses of the chapter. In that day, the song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, Salvation God will appoint for walls and fortification. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the one that keeps faithfulness. One whose imagination is steadfast, you will keep in perfect peace, for in you that person trusts. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord is a rock of ages. In that day is apocalyptic eschatological language. It points us forward to God's judgment and victorious reign. So Isaiah tells us that if we want to be kept in perfect peace, in true wholeness through everything to the very end, then we need to keep our imaginations on the right kingdom, on Zion, not the kingdoms of this world. We need to keep our imaginations on the true way of life. Our imaginations need to be steadfast. I think of myself as a fairly creative person. I love writing and arranging music, being creative in the way sounds work together. I think I'm creative in putting together a sermon or a lecture or writing. I'm drawn to art and creativity. But I've often told people that I don't have an imagination. Allow me to explain. Uh, These days, I read a lot of books. I I like to read, if you follow me on Instagram, you're sick of seeing all the books that I'm reading right now. 
A lot of it's related to theology or the Bible. It's nonfiction works. But I also try to read fiction regularly. That said, this was, I wasn't always this way. Like, I haven't been reading my whole life. In fact, I didn't really read any books until near the end of high school. And fiction, that came a few years after that. The reason why I struggled with reading fiction growing up is because I couldn't imagine or picture in my mind what the book was describing. One of my favorite authors now is Fyodor Dostoevsky, the renowned Russian novelist. And let me tell you, he spends paragraphs, sometimes even pages at a time, describing in such exhaustive detail every little aspect of a character, even if that character only appears for a few chapters. His level of detail is exhausting. And guess what? I still can't picture it in my mind. I still struggle with this. I just, I can't see it when he describes it so clearly, what the person looks like, what they're wearing, what the colors are. I still can't imagine or picture it in my mind. Uh, just in the last few months, I shared this insight with my parents, and suddenly my, my childhood aversion to reading made a lot more sense to them. This verse isn't talking about how creative we are, or how imaginative we are. Imagination here is all about how we frame the good life. What is our picture of the kingdom? What is our goal or aim in life? The word is yetzer. At its root, it means form, frame, or purpose. As one commentary put it, it is, quote, the whole attitude and habit of a person as inwardly constituted. This speaks to how we frame the world. Uh, it, it, it speaks to how we uh, have our purpose or intent in living. What are we moving towards? What is our end goal or aim in life? What is the picture we have of what it means to live well? Christian philosopher James K.A. Smith argues that our imaginations, our loves and our desires are what make us human and what determine uh, how we live our lives. We want to believe that we're thinkers. We think about something uh, long enough and then that shapes how we go about living our lives. Or we think that we're believers. It's just what we believe in, what we're convicted about, and that shapes how we actually live our lives. But Smith says this is wrong. We aren't what we think. We aren't what we believe. We are what we love. So deeper than our thoughts and our beliefs is our love or our desire, our imagination. He writes, quote, our ultimate love is oriented by and to a picture of what we think it looks like for us to live well. And that picture then governs, shapes, and motivates our decisions and actions. Coming back to idea then, if we want to be kept in true wholeness, in perfect peace, then we need to have a correct way of imagining and framing the world around us. We need to have a proper picture of what it means to live well as image bearers of our God. Our imagination needs to be fixed on God's kingdom. It needs to be steadfast. Uh, the root of steadfast is to lean or to support. It's not just that we have an imagination, a way of seeing and intending life, of framing the good life, but we are to have one that leans on, that's supported by God. See, the reality is that our imagination, our way of framing the world can easily be influenced and changed on us. It can wander, it can drift. I love the third verse of come thou fount. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Isaiah knows this. He's telling us to be steadfast because he knows our imaginations can easily drift away from God and God's kingdom and his design for how we live towards the kingdoms of this world. So let's talk about this drift. How can it happen? Propose two ways. First, we can drift towards what Mark Sayers calls the kingdom without the king. 
Sometimes the values of this world are incredibly contradictory to the values of God's kingdom. It's clear that they are different, and so we know we're supposed to stay away from them. Do we always stay away from them? Not necessarily, but what we know we're supposed to stay away from them. But here's the tricky thing. Some things that we see in society are not too different from God's vision we see in Genesis and throughout the Bible. We all want peace. We want justice. We all want blessing and good things in life for people to prosper, for the world to flourish. Mark Sayers is a pastor in Australia and he does a lot of cultural commentary. He looks at our society's drive towards progress and a better world in comparison with the Christian vision of the kingdom of God. He writes that the secular progressive myth seeks to gain the fruit of God's kingdom, such as justice, peace, prosperity, and redemption, but without the king. It's the kingdom without the king. If our imaginations are not steadfast, we can find ourselves pursuing good things, but without our king. Now let's back up for a moment. Does that mean that society's fight for justice and the pursuit of prosperity and good things in life is just completely wrong and should be utterly rejected? Not entirely. I believe that there are times where justice movements rise up outside of the church because the church has been silent. When we see the world calling for racial equality and racial justice, to an extent, that's a prophetic judgment upon the church for not living out the call of God's kingdom where everyone is made in the image of God. We need to fight for justice, to pursue the well-being of others, but we do so recognizing that Christ is king and by going about it in a way of Christ's kingdom, which is sacrificial love and service to others. See, without the king, we can pursue these good things, these righteous desires, the fruit of God's kingdom, but in distorted ways and towards distorted ends. We can drift towards the kingdoms of this world and lose sight of how we are called to be a different people, called to be part of a different kingdom, called to be surrendered under Jesus, our King. So that's the first way we can drift, towards the kingdom without the King. The second way that our imaginations can drift is towards what all call the king without his kingdom. Here we are so clear and vocal about holding on to Christ as king, but we drift away from his kingdom. A kingdom of peace and justice, of looking after the most vulnerable, of serving others sacrificially, of loving and praying for our enemies. We drift away from his kingdom and we're drawn towards a kingdom of power and authority that we see in the world around us. We can drift towards worldly success and worldly power and start to think the, our king wants these things for us. So we gotta go out there and grab them, whatever worldly means necessary. But again, our king wants us to be different, to be called out, to be ambassadors of a very different kingdom, to lay our lives down for the sake of others. We can drift towards the kingdom without the king or hold on to our king, but drift away from his kingdom. In both of these drifts, we start to look more like the world and less like our king. So, friends, How are you doing? What do you want life to look like in the coming months? What's your imagination of the good life? What's your frame? Your picture of how to live well? Your picture of the kingdom? Have you drifted towards the kingdom without a king? Pursuing justice and blessings, but losing sight of Jesus, the King. 
Or have you been sucked into the desire for power and authority, for our own rights, and so held on to the king but lost sight of his kingdom? Isaiah tells us, if we want to be kept in perfect peace, if we want to live as God intended us to live, then our imaginations need to be steadfast. We need to fix our eyes on the one true prize. The way we frame the world, our picture of the good life needs to lean into his vision, his kingdom. We need to depend on him who was there in the beginning and will be there in the end. So first, we need to make sure that our imaginations are on the right Thing, that we are fixed on the kingdom of God and the great hope of his return. But how do we keep our imaginations steadfast? If they are prone to wander, prone to drift away uh, towards the kingdoms of this world, how do we keep them properly framed? The answer in this text is to trust in and lean into God. One whose imagination is steadfast, you will keep in perfect peace, for in you they trust. The following verse exhorts us to trust in God for Yahweh as as a rock of ages. He is immovable, stable, secure. Lean into this and you won't be moved or shaken. But again, what does it look like for us to trust in God, to lean into him, to keep our imaginations steadfast? James K. Smith argues that our imaginations are inscribed in our habits. Our habits aim our love and our desire. This is crucial. See, our frame, our imagination is not determined by that one time that we thought and reflected on the kingdom of God. It's not determined by that moment where we turned and we believed in Jesus for our salvation. Our frame is not dependent on a single time or event or even a crucial event. Our frame is determined by the little things in our every days, our habits. This is why being steadfast is so important because our imaginations are continually formed and influenced. Therefore, if we want to have steadfast imaginations, we need to evaluate our habits. Two questions. Uh, Two questions for each of us to ask ourselves. Question number one, what habits influence me to drift away from God? What habits influence me to drift away from God? If you're not sure what your habits are, Uh, Answer, what do you spend your time and money on? What fills up your days? What are you watching and reading and consuming throughout your days? So your habits of uh, of consuming social media and Fox News and endless onslaught of advertisements everywhere, they shape how we picture the good life and they're causing our imaginations to drift from God's kingdom. So what habits in my days influence me to drift away from God? Remember, it's the little things in our every days. The second question is this, what habits will draw me closer to God? What habits will bring me back to God's kingdom, keep God's kingdom ever present before me? Joining us for church online is is great. It's fantastic. We're so glad that you do that. I say that every time I do a a video announcement, uh, every time I I welcome people to the church online, we always say we're so grateful, so glad that you've joined with us because we are. It's wonderful to be together, even here online. But here's the thing, it's not enough. Coming to church for an hour once a week is not enough to keep God's kingdom present before us. So how are you habituating yourself towards God's presence, towards God's kingdom throughout the week? What's your prayer life look like? How are you doing with reading your Bible, 
with connecting with others and, and forming, fostering community. We've been saying these same things for a few months now. It's because they're so essential, so important to what it means to follow Christ. Uh, recently, Kirsten and I were dissatisfied with our prayer and devotional lives. We wanted to grow deeper. We wanted them to be more meaningful. I mean, mornings are early. Uh, I don't know who put morning in the beginning of the day, but it's early. So uh, prayer and devotions had often been rele- uh, relegated to other times of the day, which meant that they didn't happen as regularly as we wanted them to be. So in the last few weeks, we've been getting up, starting our day 30 minutes earlier each day. And I can attest that spending that first 30 minutes of each day before getting on a phone, before looking at social media or the news, before doing anything else, spending that first 30 minutes has transformed my imagination through the rest of the day. Spending that time in prayer and God's word has affected how I frame the good life as I go about the little things in my every days. It's affected my desires. When I'm taking a break from work, when I open up social media, when I, when I go to watch a TV show, it has changed my satisfaction with that medium because my hunger for God's presence throughout my day has grown all from starting it 30 minutes earlier and keeping God's kingdom in front of me. At church, with the possibility of normal life on the horizon, let's not be so quick to go back to the way things were, but let's dedicate ourselves afresh to setting our hearts and minds, our imagination and frame on Christ our King and his kingdom of perfect peace. Let's pray. Lord, we need your peace. We need your perfect peace. Both in our inner lives, in our our daily activities, uh, but in our, our communities and in our world. Lord, we need your peace. And so we ask that you would uh, make your kingdom clear to us. Uh, Lord, that we would know what your kingdom is, that we would desire it in our lives. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our hearts and minds as it is in heaven, Lord. Uh, Lord, give us the courage to be able to see where we have drifted from your kingdom. Search our hearts and know, Lord, where we have gone astray, where we've, we've settled for a different picture of what the good life is, of what your kingdom is. Lord, give us the courage to face that, Uh, and the grace to be able to then correct it, to receive your correction and come back to you as our king and to your kingdom of sacrificial love and service to others. Oh Lord, our desire for peace will only ever be satisfied in you. And so Lord, we pray that you would help our imaginations be steadfast. As we go through our week As we go back into our days, Lord, would you illuminate to us where habits have drawn us away from you and help us give us the strength and the determination to form habits that bring us closer to you once again. Lord, that we would be kept in your perfect peace. So Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon our imaginations. Keep them steadfast in you. Help us to trust in you. We thank you, Lord. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
At church, just a couple of reminders. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be having the virtual Cafe Connect. It would be great to, to connect with you over Zoom. Uh, the link will be found in the chat, so you can join us there. On Wednesday, in the Coffee and Conversation, we'll provide some questions, uh, further thoughts on how to actually put this into practice, uh, how to actually change our, those habits in our life um, so that we can get our imaginations back to uh, God and his kingdom. I love you, church. God bless you. Have a great week.